So before we go into more details about Java, let's try to understand a little bit why object-oriented programming is of interest to us. So there is a very famous book by Nicholas Wirth, the inventor of the language Pascal called Algorithms plus Data Structures equal to Programs. So most people would agree that programming involves both algorithms and data structures. But the title of this book is interesting because it emphasizes the usual view that algorithms come first. So when we think about programming, we first think about what we want to do in terms of procedures. And in fact, in the 1960s and 1970s, the focus was on organizing these procedures in something called structured programming. So the idea is that instead of trying to build a large monolithic program, you break up your program into smaller units of procedures. And then if you have a library of these procedures, then when the task at hand requires to be solved, you can build an application using this library of procedures. So you first have the algorithms encoded as procedures or functions. And then since you know that you have these functions and procedures which expect information to come, data has to flow in and flow out in a particular format. You then choose the data representation for the problem at hand given the procedures. So you design your data structures to suit the procedural manipulations. So the philosophy of object oriented design is to reverse the focus of this. So here you first identify the data that you want to maintain and manipulate. So for instance, if you're building a banking system, you need to talk about customers, bank accounts, different types of deposits and so on. Then you identify the algorithms that will operate on the data. So the logic for doing it this way is that there's an argument that it works better for large systems. So let's consider a reasonably complicated application, something like a web browser. Now for the sake of argument, let's assume that a web browser consists of 2000 different functions or procedures, and all of these operate on the information that is maintained in the web browser, which, broke, which is some kind of global data about the various web pages that are open and the various things that have happened and the various addresses you have stored and so on. So you might reorganize this web browser in an object oriented framework using say 100 classes of objects. You might think of a page that is being displayed as an object and you might have operations to open it, to close it, to refresh it and so on. So say these 2000 procedures operating on a large scale global data instead get reorganized as 100 classes. Each of them has roughly 20 functions. So you still have 2000 procedures or functions, but they are organized now in this more manageable framework of 100 classes with 20 methods, maybe, maybe it might be more than 20, maybe 25, maybe you end up having more procedures, but they are localized to the classes. So one argument is that if you organize it this way, because the units that you have to comprehend are smaller, it is much easier as a programmer to grasp the design, to have a big picture of what's going on across the entire application. The other part is that debugging becomes a lot easier. So typically when a program crashes or does something unexpected, it's because some part of the program is in the incorrect state, okay? Some value is set wrong. So in object oriented terminology, some object in your program is in an incorrect state. It has the wrong values. Now what caused this to happen? So if we are in this object oriented framework, we know that that particular object is manipulated by the methods associated with it. So there may be 20 to 30 methods associated with that object and we have to check those to find out what went wrong. On the other hand, in a classical situation where we had 2000 global procedures, we have to examine each of them potentially to see which of them could have done it. So in this way, narrowing down the scope of an error also becomes easier when you manage your code in this way. So therefore, object oriented design is really a method to try and manage complex code into a more comprehensive framework that a programmer can grasp. So let's look at a typical example of how you would go about it. So supposing you are designing a system to process orders, say for an online uh, e-commerce website. So you think about what all happens in this. So there are some items that people will order. There are the orders themselves, which consists of people combining different items and then asking to pay for them. 
so they will pay for them so there will be payments there will be accounts so there might be some kind of a possibility for the customer to store some data in terms of a prepayment or have a card or something that works on that thing and of course there will be addresses where the object should be shipped so you have these different aspects which go into this ordering system and then there are things that you do with these objects right so you have to for instance construct an order by adding items once you have an order ready it may be shipped or it may be cancelled when you have a payment that is made by a customer it may be accepted or for various reasons it may be rejected so if you think about this one broad way of classifying it is that you have these nouns right so here you have at the top you have nouns right so these are things and then you have activities so these are verbs so the verbs consist of methods that operate on the nouns so the nouns are your object and the verbs are your method so this is one way of thinking about how to organize an object oriented design right so what happens now when we actually start constructing the system right so we have to design these objects so what do we have to think about so of course the most obvious thing we have to think about is the behavior of each object right so what are the kinds of things that we do to an object so what are the functions that we need to operate on objects now these functions will manipulate what is called the state of the object so each object remember will have some local variables we call them instance variables so the setting of the instance variables is usually called the state of the object so it might be in an initial state it might be in a in an order situation for instance you might have an empty order then you might have an order which has been put into the shopping cart and then you might have an order which has been fulfilled and shipped right so the state is the information that you have in the instance variables and one of the fundamental principles of object oriented design and abstract data types in general is that this information should be encapsulated right so the information that is inside which is the state of the object should not be available outside except through the methods that you have defined so any change that happens to the state should happen through a method so if there is a change of state you can narrow down which methods could have changed the state and try to track down what's going on finally one of the ideas here is that you have these templates or classes and you have many different objects so you need a way to keep track of them right so you need to have ways of identifying these objects from each other and this identification is not necessarily only in terms of state there could be many objects of a given type which are all in the same state two people could order the same exact same kind of things so if you look at the state of the order it might say that they have exactly the same items which are being ordered but they are still two different orders so you have to maintain the identity of objects so that you don't mix them up now these broad features of objects of course are not unconnected so the state of an object will typically tell you what you can do with it right so the behavior is typically a function of the state so when you have an order you typically want to add items to the order but if the order has already been shipped it has been completed and shipped you can no longer add so an order may remain in the system because the customer may want to go back and look up old orders so the order may not be cancelled from the system but it has a state in which you cannot change it so you cannot add things on the other hand if you have done nothing you have just started and created an empty order then it makes no sense to ship it so therefore the operations you can perform on an object will be affected naturally by the state so these are not mutually exclusive things so when you talk about behavior you have to think about state also an identity at the same time because one object may think of talk about the identity of another object so if you look at the relationship between different classes of objects that we have in our system there could be a dependence right one type of object may require another type of object or one class may require another class to do its work for instance if you are placing an order and then this order is going to be paid for by say the wallet of a customer this wallet will be stored in the account so the order needs to know something about the account so the class order will depend on the class account on the other hand the individual items which are for sale have information about their price their what type of item they are and so on and how much maybe how much you have in stock now clearly an item is going to be in use only if it is part of an order but on its own an item needs to know nothing about a customer's bank account or payment wallet or whatever so items do not depend on accounts so we can be sure that if we are if we do something with the accounts implementation nothing will change for item and vice versa and this in general is a principle that we would like to follow not just 
in this but in every kind of programming but here it's particularly easy to think of it this way because we have these different objects and you would like to decouple them right so if you have dependencies between objects then they are supposed to be coupled the coupling between classes so you want to minimize the coupling to make your system robust so that if you change something in one place it should not change something in another place of course the other thing that you can do with classes is nest them right so what is an order an order consists of items so items will always be added to orders so an order object will contain item objects the other thing that we will see as we go along is inheritance we've already talked about this loosely but the main reason that object oriented programming is richer than just abstract data types is the idea that you can have one data type which is a enhanced version of another type right or a specialized version of another type so for instance we have orders but there may be some kind of a way by which a customer can pay extra and ask for quicker delivery so we might have something called an express order so an express order would be very much like an order it will have all the features of an order it will have items and so on a shipping address but it will also have extra things about how much extra has to be paid what is the kind of delivery service that is going to be used and so on so we have this notion of inheritance where you can take an existing class and enhance it so to summarize we want to understand object oriented the motivation for object oriented programming because that will drive really our understanding of how a language like java has been designed right so the purpose of this course is not to teach you how to build systems using object oriented programming this is not a software engineering course this is a course about programming languages and programming language design so through java we are going to illustrate various features and in particular because java is object oriented but a lot of these features will be tied to object oriented programming so we are not going to try and emphasize how to write good object oriented programming or what are good naming conventions for variables or how to organize your objects and so on but it's good to understand why object oriented programming is useful because otherwise some of the design decisions and some of the features available in the language do not really make sense